I understand uh, for Dr. Billia, we have a video. Video. Coming up. Yeah. If we could roll the video. I'm Dr. Phyllis Billia from the Piedmont Cardiac Center in Toronto, and it is my pleasure to talk about the role of hypothermia and cardiogenic shock over the next few minutes. I have nothing to disclose. To improve survival after sudden cardiac arrest, the AHA published the concept of the chain of survival back in 1991, a phrase that was first coined by Peter Safar. The chain of survival was there in an effort to gain uh, spontaneous circulation as early as in the field by paramedics, the emergency physicians, and then later on by the intensivists. And with the improvement in getting ROS, the number of critically ill patients requiring care in the ICU grew. The early mortality um, after resuscitation arises from the underlying cardiogenic shock state and the precipitating cause of the cardiac arrest, whereas the later mortality is largely caused by neurological injury and end organ damage as a sequela of the cardiac arrest. Early data from the hypothermia after cardiac arrest study group in the early 2000s showed that there could be some benefit to target temperature management. Target temperature management, or TTM, is a strategy of deliberate temperature management with active cooling rewarming, and extended fever control. After ROSC, all comatose patients with Glasgow coma scales less than 8 and, and aged greater than 18 years are currently recommended to undergo TTM and to achieve temperatures between 32 and 36 degrees. Cooling or active prevention of pyrexia does decrease brain and other end organ damage by lowering tissue metabolism potentially limiting infarct size at the level of the heart, but most importantly, attenuating the ischemia of your perfusion injury. The evidence is that in the absence of effective TPM and fevers greater than 37.7 degrees, this is associated with a poor outcome, and the worst outcomes are associated when temperatures are greater than 39 degrees. Initial clinical trials with mild hyperthermia uh, within 12 to 24 hours of care versus usual care showed improved survival and neurological outcomes after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in patients, um, cardiac arrest in patients with uh, shockable rhythms. In 2019, the results of an open-label trial were presented in the New England. This was a trial of 584 patients from 25 ICUs, and it was based on uh, patients who had experienced out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, who were then randomized to TTM or um, regard sorry regardless of shockable rhythm. However, this study failed to show uh, superiority of other groups. Written guidelines, though, strongly recommend TTM, uh, but don't, do state that there is evidence of low certainty. This was then followed with another study that again was published in the New England last year, looking at 1,900 adults with out of hospital cardiac arrest. Now, in this study, patients were randomized to hypothermia versus, uh, with temperatures targeting 33 degrees Celsius or normal thermia. The results of this RCT showed that both, uh, both the hypothermia and the normothermia group, 50% um, of patients died, and there was no difference with respect to functional outcome at either six months uh, um, for survival or neurological outcomes. Interestingly, in looking at the adverse events, arrhythmias were more common in the hypothermia group, that's 27% versus 17%, but it was no difference in other pre-specified adverse events. This is in direct contrast with the results from the study that was published 20 years ago where the benefit of hypothermia was reported. But a lot has changed in the last 20 years as it relates to ICU care of these patients. This is not the only trial that has shown these results. This trial does have several limitations. This was not a blinded intervention and may have been influenced by outcomes and there were no control groups per se. In addition, about 20% of patients were co-enrolled in another trial. The paper was originally out in June of 2021 in, the, in uh, New England, and in September there was actually a letter to the editor with uh, mentioning some several concerns about this study. Most of it related to the generaliz generalizability of the study in that 75% of patients in the world had a shockable rhythm and only 80% of patients had uh, received standard CPR, by standard CPR, sorry, um, and a few other variables were discussed. Around the same time, though, there was a review of the literature that was being done as well. In this systematic review that was published last year in resuscitation, the author started off with over 3,400 articles from PubMed, Embase, and Cochrane for the last 20 years, 2001 to 2020. From a total of 32 trials that were published between this time point, only nine trials 
uh, compared normal thermia and hypothermia with temperatures at 32 to 34 degrees. And most of the trials were small feasibility or pilot studies with only three trials ha having more than 100 patients enrolled. The overall summary of this systematic review and meta-analysis was that there was no benefit to TTM um, as compared to normothermia, although the certainty of evidence was low. In the setting of cardiac arrest, an additional way forward has been through VA ECMO and particularly in the setting of eCPR. There have been some studies that are looking at the outcomes in doing eCPR in specific jurisdictions like in France, the Czech Republic, Taiwan, for example, but there also have been some studies that considered ECMO in the acute setting with hypothermia. In the ELSO registry for report from 2021, the survival to hospital discharge in adults with eCPR is still as low as 30%, but there is no further granularity with respect to targeted temperature management in these patients. And considering eCPR with hypothermia, one of the first reports were from the CHEER trial in 2015, which was published in Resuscitation. This was a single center trial comparing only 26 patients, and it was a feasibility trial, but the authors did conclude that they thought hypothermia was associated with a higher survival than eCPR alone. Meta-analysis based on 21 full text articles conducted in 2021 looked at um, this more um, and considered uh, a more suitable CPR strategy for patients with cardiac arrest. And from their search of the literature, they found 21 full text articles uh, from 2000 to 2020. And the studies included in the analysis were from all over the world with a smattering of characteristics included. Many of the studies were primarily from patients who had not, who had, sorry, out of hospital cardiac arrest with the majority of witnessed arrest. There was inconsistent use of bystander CPR and surprisingly the time of initiation of cannulation ranged from 34 minutes to 185 minutes. But more importantly, most of these studies were retrospective in nature and only five studies were, uh, were prospectively uh, designed or RCT de um, designed. They all had small sample sizes that ranged from 600 to 231 patients. But there was a, a favorable survival to hospital discharge over uh, to 28 days with an odds ratio of 2.27 and better neurological outcome again with an odds ratio greater than two in the group that received hypothermia. The benefit holds true for survival outcomes at three months for both survival and neurological outcomes. Is there RCT data? Well, yes. This year, in fact, in JAMA, Bruno Levy and the ECMO net published the results of an RCT of early initiation of hypothermia versus normal thermia for 24 hours in patients with cardiogenic shock supported with VA ECMO. There were 20 centers in France um, collecting data from patients from 2016 to 2019. And they did this to answer the question, does early hypothermia improve mortality in patients with cardiogenic shock supported by VA ECMO? In this trial, they had 374 patients that were randomized to hyperthermia or normal thermia. The primary outcomes was mortality at 30 days, and they had included 31 secondary outcomes, including mortality at 7 days, 60 days, 180 days, etc. Now, at 30 days, what they found was 42% of patients <coughs> died in the hypothermia group versus 51% in the normal thermia group. However, this was not statistically significant with a p-value of only 0.07. There was also a small study from last year, but it was a single center experience with patients on VA ECMO. This study was able to demonstrate improved neurological recovery with targeted temperature management, but uh, there was no association with improved mortality with hypothermia. So what we're left with is actually more questions than answers, I think. From 20 years of experience with changes in patient management in the ICU, we've seen the development of protocolization and approach to patient care. Neurological prognostication has become very important and with improved survival outcomes over time. There's limited number of RCTs with limitations in these studies and the interesting observation in larger RCTs, um, which was the length of time that it actually takes to cool a patient is surprising. There are different methods of cooling patients and that needs to be accounted for. And there's very limited data for in-hospital cardiac arrest with hypothermia. Thank you. And Dr. Phyllis so what does the panel think? What's your experience? Go ahead. So <clears throat> I think that this is a great example of how a well-conducted, well-powered, randomized trial can change the 
recognition of a therapy in, in the patient population. And we were all so convinced that this would work. And then so surprised that TTM2 changed this. However, I think, and you, you also said that, and I think it's, this is uh, worth to be highlighted, I do not consider this to be a negative trial because the, the control group still had an intervention strategy which is preventing fever, keeping the temperature at 36 degrees. Um, so there is something we can do, but we, the trial kind of says to us that we shouldn't do too much. We do not need to go as slow. And probably by preventing uh, complication, we improve the outcome for the patients. Dr. Billy, we see you here today, so thank you for joining mm -hmm. us now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I, David had a question. So, Phyllis, so what do you do now in Canada, seeing all this data when the rubber meets the road? Do you use normothermia, hypothermia, or none of the above? We can't hear you. Oh, you're muted, Phyllis. Sorry about that. I was, I was told to actually unmute before. Um, so we, were, we tend to actually do still hypothermia in certain situations. Um, but I think this is something that needs to be revisited. I would say, though, that probably the best clinical trial has yet to be had. I think now with all the work that's being done in France and Taiwan with ECPR and the strategies that are actually looking at um, putting everything together, a multifaceted approach to care, would then, uh, which also includes revascularization, should be incorporated in these sudden cardiac arrest patients because then we're actually doing every single intervention that we can and then comparing. So the variables up to date have been, you know, early bystander CPR, a witness arrest, and then transfer to a center that can do angiography as needed. I think now it is plus or minus uh, hypothermia would be the best uh, possible scenario. Can you expand on just on that point about uh, revascularization and taking patients to the cath lab? We were pretty involved with this cooling uh, at Arizona with Carl Kern and the gang. And, uh, you know, but we made a position, even for those who were in the lab, that we would take every patient to the cath lab, which was a big burden on everybody. But we did it. And I think, you know, we found things that we didn't otherwise expect. And I think that's an important variable that has to be teased apart uh, in, in this. Any thoughts on that? And then Mike? I think wants to weigh in on that too. Yeah, absolutely. So there's been a couple of trials now that are ECPR trials that are coming out. There was the arrest trial. Um, so there's different places, right, that are really publishing on this. So Czech Republic, Taiwan, the Taiwan group has published, as well as the um, the France group. And it's clear that just by doing ECPR with re early revascularization that there is some trend towards an improved outcome. But hyperthermia has not been put in, into that context. Right. It seems that the more that we do in a coordinated effort, the better outcomes we could potentially have. I think theoretically, hypothermia does have benefit in terms of being able to actually reduce the um, the need, like in terms of the metabolic milieu that's happening in an ischemia reperfusion injury, which is you know, not a small thing. So I don't think the right trial has yet to be done. But at least the ECPR piece, I think, is being answered, and there's still a couple more trials that are coming out out of Europe in the next year or so that would be really interesting to, to look at those results and make sure that that is actually holds true in multiple jurisdictions. Um, and then, I mean, the reality is, is how many of us are going to have these waving ECPR buses? Uh, I, I'll tell you that in Toronto, we're still not funded for uh, ECMO, let alone ECPR. So it gets very challenging to be able to offer these to everybody. Got it. Mike? Yeah, that, this is a really nice review. Um, the uh, HypoECMO trial out of France had a combined endpoint uh, early on that looked significant. And when they used hypothermia, it was to 33. So it wasn't uh, to normal thermia. And if you look at the two curves on the Kaplan-Meier, they, 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 they're separating. It's at 30 days. Well, if you look at the original shock trial, that didn't turn positive until six months later. So the, the time point was, was, was very early. And I suspect that as further reports come out on the hypoecmo uh, uh, France uh, results, we'll see uh, a shift toward it being more, more significant. Introduce the next, what's his name? Menon. Okay. I don't disagree, we'll have to see. <laughs> All right, we want to thank you for your participation, and uh, sadly, we have to keep moving. So again, thanks.